59's morning news, a bombshell development from the court in Canberra with a man accused of raping Brittany Higgins has been on trial. The jury dismissed in the case aborted due to juror misconduct. What happens next? We'll take you live to our reporter who was inside the court. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And after 12 days of evidence, five days of deliberation by the jury and blanket media coverage, we finally get a result of sorts in the nation's high-profile rape case. And it was an outcome that satisfied no one. Shocking development that the jury in the Bruce Loma rape trial has officially been discharged. Chief Justice Lucy McCallum explained one of the jurors had brought research material into the jury room that they shouldn't have. The discovery was made by a sheriff. Uh, he was tidying up. He knocked one of the jurors' folders onto the floor and he found a research paper, uh, the subject of which was sexual assault. Yes, it was a juror, not the media, that scuppered the trial. And in a case that's almost as hot overseas as it is here, the headline writers had a dramatic new angle to run with. Inside the sensational collapse of Australia's most explosive rape trial. Australian judge orders new trial in rape case that shook capital. A chance discovery ends the trial of Bruce Lerman. The new trial in which Lerman is pleading not guilty will start in February next year. And until then, Justice McCullum is hoping the media will back off, telling the court... I would expect that after reporting the outcome of the trial today, that reporting of this matter should fall silent so that the accused should have a fair trial. But that did not stop a distraught Brittany Higgins from delivering her own verdict on the justice system to reporters waiting outside the court. Many of you in the media have been called out for labelling the last few weeks the Higgins trial but I don't blame you because it's very clear who has been on trial. Seven, Nine, the ABC and Sky took her speech live. And there was also no hesitation from Nine's newspapers, which printed Higgins' statement in full. That's despite Bruce Lerman's lawyer referring it to the police, suggesting it could be in contempt of court, saying in a statement... I urge all media to show restraint in reporting this matter, and in particular in republishing the statements made by the complainant. One paper that did heed the advice was News Corp's Daily Telegraph, which summed up all the day's drama with this front page. Don't speak. Court shock. Higgins referred to police after post-mistrial comments. And did the telly and the other News Corp tabloids publish Higgins' statement? Well, yes, in part, but with far more caution than showed by Nine, choosing to blank out several paragraphs and words, citing legal considerations, and saying media companies who went the full Monty could be found in contempt. And that warning would apply to their colleagues at The Australian, because like the nine papers, it ran Higgins' speech in full on page five. Funny that, because on page four, Janet Ulbrichson was ranting about the rule of law, saying... If Higgins' statements outside court on Thursday morning amount to contempt, they ought to be prosecuted too. Ulbrichson also attacked unnamed crusaders in the media and legal profession for, quote, lowering the guardrails of justice and damaging the foundations of our legal system, the presumption of innocence and the right to a fair trial. McCallum's criticism of sections of the media before the Lerman trial commenced was spot on. What concerns me the most is that the distinction between an allegation and a finding of guilt has been completely obliterated. The fact that Lerman was not convicted somewhat weakens the argument that the media stopped him getting a fair trial and suggests the legal system is tough enough to cope. But there clearly is a debate to be had about how the media reported Brittany Higgins' allegations and whether it went too far. However, much as we would love to start it now, we are going to heed those warnings from Justice McCullum and come back to it when the legal system has been allowed to do its job. We hope others will do likewise. But now, to the race that stops the nation, which is on tomorrow, and which has a News Corp venture in a spot of bother. News Corp backed better, probed over Melbourne Cup odds. Online wagering upstart Better Australia is facing an investigation by New South Wales's gambling watchdog over concerns the new company broke gaming laws by offering 100 to 1 odds for the November 1st Melbourne Cup. Oh dear, naughty, naughty. Offering crazy odds to punters who open a betting account can be an inducement to gamble, which is illegal. And Better's odds, splashed across the News Corp tabloids in these huge double-page ads, were mad. A hundred to one odds. Any horse to win the Melbourne Cup. Maximum bet $10, one bet per customer. Ads for that wager ran in all of News Corp's big city tabloids in Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, Adelaide and Hobart. And predictably, the punters came rushing. 
The cut favourite, Dover Legend, was only five to one in the market, offering winnings of $50 for a $10 bet. But Better was promising to pay $1,000 for the same $10 stake, or 20 times the reward for the same amount of risk. So, is Better now in trouble? Possibly, yes, because New South Wales Liquor and Gaming has ordered the company to explain why it should not be prosecuted. As it told the AFR... We are investigating and will respond to any breaches with the full force of the law. So who is better? Well, it's a new sports betting company, 33% owned by News Corp, which was launched last month as the spring racing season got underway. It's run by Matthew Tripp, who built BetEasy and Sportsbet into huge Australian brands, and he's made it clear that he chummed up with News Corp for the group's enormous promotional punch. Tripp said his ambitions to launch another wagering company came from the idea of leveraging the assets of media partner News Corp, which owns the cable and streaming company Foxtel, as well as mastheads including The Australian and The Daily Telegraph. And you can add another Murdoch Spruker to that powerful list because ads on Sky News have also been pushing the company. That's why we've made a betting brand for sports fans. That's better. Gamble responsibly. But ads in the News Corp tabloids have been pushing even harder. While the 100 to 1 offer is no longer running in the Telegraph, thanks to the New South Wales gambling watchdog, it has been blazing away in the other tabloids in a campaign worth millions of dollars. With 17 ads on our count in the Courier Mail, 17 in the Herald Sun, and 24 in the Advertiser in around two weeks. And the Murdoch tabloids are also running generic ads for the better brand. What's more, they have new branded editorial pages highlighting bets for punters with a handy QR code at the bottom to take you straight to the betting site. It's hard to imagine a bigger blitzkrieg, but you can expect to see more editorial in future. News Corp has staked millions in the USA on a sports betting venture called Foxbet. And here's a segment on Fox and Friends, spruiking a $5,000 Foxbet quiz with all the hosts playing along. You gotta download the app to get that sixth question. Oh. And and don't forget, Terry Bradshaw's $1 million jackpot is back for week two of the NFL season. Make your Fox Super 6 picks now and your chance to win big. <laughs> Foxbet is one of the official betting partners of America's National Football League, the NFL. And Better is hoping to match that in Australia by partnering with the AFL and slotting into Foxtel's footy coverage. In which case, expect to see segments like this. All right, let's check in with Sportsbet for the latest. Grand final day is building nicely. We've had the same amount of money for both. Only with News Corp's better branding instead. So, apart from bringing us wall-to-wall -wall gambling promotion, which is bad enough, what might this marriage bring to News Corp's coverage of gambling? And will the tabloids be fearless in their reporting? One hint lies in News Corp's treatment of better's current run-in with the New South Wales gaming regulator. Tough, honest, straight down the line, well, no, because there hasn't been any coverage, or not as far as we can see. But the telly has told readers how well the new betting brand is going. Better has five times as many customers than it expected at this point in time and has already taken more than a million bets in only 12 days since launching. And that was a week ago. Last month, when Better was launched, Crikey's Bernard Keane asked... Who will hold to account a major online gambling company with direct links to the nation's most powerful media organisation? But there is a bigger, broader problem. And that is, how tough will News Corp journalists be, for example, on proposals to limit gambling ads on TV? Or on the growing scourge of problem gambling in sports betting? I fear we know the answer. The gambling industry is already a massive money spinner for the media spending $287 million on advertising in 2021, according to the Victorian Responsible Gambling Foundation. And every day on Victorian free-to-air TV, there were on average 948 gambling ads. Yes, 948 every day. And that bonanza already tempts companies to break the rules. 10 days ago, seven and nine were nailed by the broadcasting watchdog, the ACMA. Seven for showing 49 betting ads during the Olympics, when children would have been watching, and nine for broadcasting a betting ad during the NRL Grand Final. But owning a betting outfit promises even bigger financial rewards and even more pressure on journalists. And problem gambling expert Charles Livingstone from Monash University sees danger. News Corp will take this one step further, I think. 
To their credit, the Herald Sun and, to a lesser extent, the Daily Telegraph have been critical of poker machine gambling, especially where it involves football codes. But of course, having a deal with a wagering company seems likely to muzzle critical voices. We hope he's wrong. We fear he's not. In future, getting media support for curbs on gambling and protection for problem gamblers is likely to be more and more difficult to come by. We asked News Corp whether it now has a major conflict of interest between its commercial advantage and editorial integrity. It ignored our questions, but told us... News Corp is a minority shareholder in Better and has no control of its daily operations. And you can read the full statement, which does not address the issues we raised, on our website, along with a statement from New South Wales Gaming, which says it remains seriously concerned about Better's ad campaign. But now to the story of a celebrity surgeon and his celebrity media supporters. It's a question that needs an answer. answer, answer. Why can't Australia's most celebrated brain surgeon... I think I'm the best. I'm the best. ...operate in his own country? Kate McClymont cuts through to the real shocking story. A major investigation, 12 months chasing the truth. On 60 Minutes last week and across Nine's mastheads, one of the country's best investigative reporters, Kate McClymont, detailed shocking allegations, which he denies, against celebrated neurosurgeon Dr Charlie Teo, whom the medical authorities have essentially banned from operating in Australia while they investigate. Tonight we hear from shattered patients who paid a heavy price after Dr Teo convinced them that in his hands, miracles can happen. It was powerful stuff. Patients left worse off after risky surgery. When he, Gene hopped back in the car, I said, it's got a bad. He just shook his head and I just started crying straight away, all the way home. It was, as McClymont explained, a very different story to the one that many in the media like to tell about T.O. Charlie Teo's self-proclaimed surgical superiority and heroic outcomes have been glorified by the media for years. They lionise the motorbike riding rebel who fearlessly took on the medical establishment, courageously operating when others said nothing more could be done. So it is no surprise that when McClymont's stories landed, a media civil war broke out, especially at nine where Dr Teo's longtime friends helped him counter the damaging revelations. Teo had refused an interview on 60 Minutes, but he accepted the chance to appear on A Current Affair, and after that, his defence began in earnest on Nine's Today Show, where Carl Stefanovic announced... Just before we get um, cracking, I uh, just wanted to say too and acknowledge that both Alex and I are ambassadors uh, for the Charlie Teo Foundation, uh, and will continue to be so. Yeah. Alex yeah. being Alex Cullen, today's newsreader. But conflict of interest be damned. Carl took part in the interview anyway. And as Alison Langdon asked the questions that needed to be asked, he tossed in softballs like this. There's a constant reference to you as being money hungry and, and you know, wanting, charging excessive amounts of money. Um, I've you know, known you for a long time, I've never known you to be that. I'm driven by the patients. I mean, it's as simple as that. And not content with that defence, Stefanovic went to the Daily Mail this weekend to heap even more praise on the doctor calling the criticism a pile-on. I would hate to see this guy and all of his talent exterminated from a profession that he's so gifted at. It would be a travesty. Carl has since apologised to nine colleagues for speaking out, the network confirmed today. And we understand there was significant upset in the Herald newsroom about him undermining their work. But Carl wasn't the embattled doctor's only friend in the House of Nine. There was another one lining up at 2GB. What they're suggesting here, your critics, is that you are some kind of money-hungry egomaniac yeah. who just wants to take people's money and risk people's lives. But that's not the business you're in. You're in the business of saving lives. And on the money front, I mean, do you need the money? Ben, again, I find this incredibly despicable. And Ben Fordham, it seemed, agreed. I'm just putting these questions to you that are coming from your critics. They're not coming from me. I'm on the record many times as saying, and I'll say it until the day I die, I've met so many families who love what you've done for them. Ben Fordham is hosting a fundraiser for the Charlie Teo Foundation on Sydney Harbour later this month. Billed as a night of hope, VIP tickets are $500 a pop. But Teo has links to other nine presenters. Richard Wilkins, Peter Overton, Jim Wilson and Chris Smith are all listed as ambassadors for the Charlie Teo Foundation. And Smith is another who's made Teo's case on air. 
So there you are abroad, working on a pro bono basis on surgery, teaching and lecturing because the world wants and needs your skills, but at home, they're trying to trash you. Meantime, while the Sydney Morning Herald and two medical watchdogs were investigating cases of Dr Teo's that went tragically wrong, News Corp's Daily Telegraph was getting in there and fighting for the doctor. Dying patients begging for help. No other doctor will operate. But top surgeon has hands tied. That front page splash landed four weeks before Nine's investigation, along with four more pages showcasing the surgeon's success stories. Then nine days ago, on the eve of Nine's expose, readers were hit with another double page spread. And on Saturday, the telly was giving Teo more real estate to answer his critics and the 60 Minutes allegations along with another patient's miracle survival story. And who does Teo have to thank for all those positive stories? Reporter Sidoni Marden, who has her own conflict in regards to Teo, not as an ambassador, but as a success story herself, as she revealed five years ago. I was 37 when the surgeon told me I had brain cancer. Sidoni Marden survived thanks to Dr Teo's intervention. And while Saturday's coverage did disclose her relationship as a former patient, not all of her stories do. Given how many she writes, we think they all should. And what of Tio's TV and radio friends at Nine? A Nine spokesperson told us... The interviews were handled appropriately by all our people. Any connections were declared and Mr Tio was interrogated independently in each instance without bias. Without bias? Really? As to whether they should be ambassadors at all, Nine says that is a matter for them. Tio is without question a lifesaver. He's also faced serious accusations from patients and his own colleagues. Getting to the truth is what real journalism is about. Charlie's media fanboys and girls should stay well away. And that is all from us for tonight. Don't forget our latest episodes of Media Bites on Facebook, YouTube and iView. But for now until next week, goodbye.